Hello, my name is Professor David Sharp and I'm the Chair of the Open University's Stage 1 Engineering Skills Module. During your qualification, you will encounter various forms of practical work. From hands-on investigation, using experiment kits sent to your home, to modelling work using industry standard simulation software, to remote experimentation where you will use your home computer to control high-end equipment housed here in the Open University's award-winning Open STEM laboratories. If you carry on to master's level study, you will also carry out group work in a face-to-face -face residential setting. Let's take a look at one of the home experiments that you will carry out during stage one of your studies. So Zara, what have we got here? This is the first of three home experiment kits that the student receive. The experiments are all designed to consolidate and build on the learning of previous stage one engineering modules. They explore the theme of energy in the home and involve applying uh, the principles of electrochemistry to create simple batteries, building circuits uh, to explore uh, the behavior of different electrical components and putting all into practice to understand how a solar cell works. Okay, so can we have a look inside and see what's in the box? Yes, of course. This is the lab book and some uh, graph uh, sheets the student received. We have got uh, disposable gloves. Mm -hmm. We've got nose pliers. Yeah. And uh, galvanized washers and some crocodile clips. And I can see over here, this looks very much like, is this a multimeter? This is a multimeter. Uh, and is that used in some of the experiments? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, um, and I can see that there's more underneath here. So yeah, we've got uh, dionized water, ice cube tray, and battery for multimeter, Epsom salt. So lots of components in here then. Um, so next thing, can we try setting up one of the experiments? Yes, of course. So Zara, what experiments are you going to show us? I have got all the components to recreate Alessandro Volta's experiments of over 200 years ago uh, when he made what is now referred to as voltaic pile and is uh, recognized these days as the first battery. What we need for this experiment first, we need to use a, a washer, a copper washer, uh, as a template to cut uh, uh, circles of blotting paper. Okay, so you've done that already, I can see. Yes, I've done that already. This is the blotting paper. So we use copper strip as a base on a non-metallic surface and add blotting uh, disc on top of that and add a galvanized uh, zinc coated uh, washers on top. Okay. Then we set the multimeter to 20 volt. Then we use the calm prob lead uh, firmly uh, on the galvanized washer and the other lead on the copper strip and then read the voltage which shows zero. Zero. So not very impressive at the moment then. Absolutely. Nothing happening. Nothing happening because we need to introduce electrolyte okay. to produce voltage. For doing that, uh, what we need to do, we need to add uh, 10 crystals of Epsom salt into, a tab, uh, into 200 ml uh, liter of tap water. Okay. Looks a bit fiddly. Yes, it is a bit fiddly. So... Then you can use a wooden spoon and make sure to stir it well that all the uh, salt dissolve in this water. Then what we can do is use one of these uh, disc, blotting a disc, and add it to the water. Yeah, getting it nice and wet. Then make sure to dab it on the tissue and uh, there's, there must be no excess of water. Okay. Then do the experiment again. So you're just putting the blotting paper back on the copper strip. Exactly. And then galvanize zinc coated washer on top of that and do the same thing again. And can you see the voltage now? Ah, yes. So it's gone up. What's it? 0.67 volts. That's correct, yeah. Wow. Because Because okay. we introduce uh, electrolyte now. And okay. with electrolyte, we can see uh, the current can flow. Okay, so I can see we've, we've got a current here um, and you created a battery, but it really doesn't look like a modern battery. 
Well, even the most sophisticated modern day batteries, such as those found in mobile phones or electric cars, are based uh, exactly on the same principles that I have just demonstrated. Uh, over the um, past 200 years, uh, battery engineers uh, have explored different materials and designs to improve uh, sustainability, efficiency, and longevity. Okay, so just from these early beginnings, we now have our modern batteries. That's right. Well, that's fascinating. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. As you progress to stage two of your engineering studies, you'll carry out more complex, hands-on practical investigations and develop your critical thinking skills. To help demonstrate one of these practical investigations, I have my colleague here, Dr. Richard Moat. Richard, what are you doing? Hello, I'm building a one metre high tower out of straws and foam board, and then I'm going to shake it using this shaker table. Okay, why? So the theme of the second level engineering practical activities is vibration and resonance. And we're going to use the sensors embedded in this microcontroller to collect data to understand the oscillating behavior of this tower. But can you really get useful information from a tower made of straws? Yes. So what we're doing here is simulating some of the world's largest skyscrapers, just at a much smaller scale. And then we're going to use mathematics to relate one to the other. We can use the microcontroller to, to change parameters and see how that affects the structure. Something which, if we were to do in real life, would be time consuming, not to mention expensive. Well, I can see, Richard, you've still got a little way to go before you complete this tower. Um, but in true Blue Peter style, we do have one that we made earlier. So this is our completed tower, but I'm not going to switch it on just yet. You'll have to wait a minute for that, because first of all, I'm going to talk to one of my colleagues, Dr. Fiona Gleed, who's been busy building her own tower at home. Fiona, how have you been getting on? I've just finished building it, and I'm now getting, going to start it shaking. So there's a pendulum in the tower, which helps to reduce the amplitude of the motion and we can tune it further using elastic bands to provide damping. So is that what happens in real skyscrapers? The principle is certainly used in many high-rise buildings. For example, the fantastically tall Taipei 101 in Taiwan, which is an area very prone to earthquakes, has a pendulum with a 5.5 metre diameter steel ball, weighing 660 tonnes. Gosh, that's pretty heavy. So we've got students making up these towers in their own homes. Do they then get the chance to share their findings and compare their results? Yes, each of the practical experiments has a dedicated forum running whilst the students are doing it. We have specialist tutors moderating the forums to provide support and the students can also share their results and support each other through the week. Right, well thank you so much Fiona. I can see your tower is still shaking away there. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye now because we're going to set our own tower shaking just now. As well as carrying out hands-on experimentation at home, throughout your engineering qualification, you will also conduct remote experiments where, via the internet, you will use your home computer to control real-life equipment housed in the OU's Open STEM laboratories. If you carry out master's level study, perhaps by studying for an MEng, you'll be doing group work in a face-to-face -face residential environment. To tell us more about this is Jan Koval, Chair of our Postgraduate Team Engineering module. This module comes at the end of several years of engineering study. So by then our students will have developed a range of professional and technical skills. The module asks them to draw on these skills uh, and show that they can work together in teams to develop a highly technical report on an engineering challenge. Team working is a tricky thing, especially when the team members are remote from one another. So we help them to get into this by first of all bringing them together at a residential weekend 
where they form their teams and we set them a an open-ended practical task which they carry out in their newly formed teams this allows them to gel together to reflect on different team roles, how they work together in teams, how they make decisions and that prepares them for the months ahead when they'll be remote from one another using online tools to communicate and to collaborate in producing a highly technical report on a highly technical problem. So in this way the students are getting experience of both face-to-face -face and remote group working. Absolutely and we feel that this is an accurate representation of what team working is like in the real world where you have teams distributed across the country or even across the globe. An example of that might be the Airbus project where the engine, the fuselage and the wings are all designed and built in different sites across Europe but they come together to form a single highly integrated system. That's great, thank you Jan. To get an employer's perspective on the Open University's engineering teaching I'm talking to Rich Hampshire Vice President at CGI UK, who has over 30 years experience in the utilities sector. Rich, tell me about how you've come to know the Open University's engineering qualifications. So David, we've been working with the Open University for over a decade now. It all began when the Open University and CGI were both partners on a regulatorily funded innovation project and lasted for about four to five years. After that, we chose to sponsor a PhD here at the Open University based on the innovation project. And through that period, our understanding of the Open University, what you offer, the caliber of the students that come out at the end of it, uh, developed and our appreciation of those students grew. And as an employer, how do you feel about the academic content within the Open University degrees? It matches very much what, what we need as an employer. Um, but as much as anything, it's about how we see the Open University being a cultural fit to our organisation and therefore the calibre of the people who come out of the Open University being a cultural fit for us. And as our Open University engineering students progress through their qualifications, they encounter quite a variety of different practical and group working activities. How do you feel that these meet the needs of the sector? Our practical experience and doing practicals as part of a degree is vital. It, for me, it makes it what they're learning academically come alive. It helps them to get a, an appreciation of the sort of things that they will be doing in the workplace. And that speeds their, their transition into work, which is great from an employer's perspective. How do you feel the sector views open university graduates more generally? For my organisation, it's a good cultural fit. Um, but the quality and calibre of people coming out of the Open University typically have thought more about what they want to study, um, perhaps based on more life experience, um, but also they're highly motivated. They've made the, their choices, they understand why they've made those choices. And like all employers, motivated employees are vital to our success. I hope this has given you a flavour of the range of practical and group working activities that you will encounter during your Open University engineering studies. I'd just like to finish by wishing you all the best as you progress through your qualification. Mm -hmm.